Hey everybody, Jessica Henry Gray here. I'm excited to be back today. I am going to demonstrate painting a pomegranate. So I'm gonna to try to keep this video today, lesson today uh, quite a bit shorter than last week's lesson. Um, it was a little long, but uh, you know, there's always so much to say, especially when you're talking about setting up a still life. So this week I wanna show you, I already have it set up. I just have a really simple pomegranate and I like to cut mine open in two places. And so I have uh, this gorgeous red, they're really deep red this time of year. Um, I've cut it open twice and kind of split it open, but not all the way down. I didn't cut it all the way down. Um, and then I, I like it so that I can kind of see some of the berries on the inside. And then I have just some scattered around and I went with sort of a lighter background on my arrangement today instead of the dark like I normally do. Anyway, so I'm just kind of uh, yammering a little bit about what I have set up here while we get more people. It's good to see you guys. Um, I am going to be putting this video on YouTube and uh, I will do that probably later today and um, I'm excited to share these and be on here a little bit more with you guys. Uh, so anyway, that's um, that's kind of my it for my intro. I also wanted to just tell you while we're waiting that um, I we are still we have our bracelets for sale um, with the Heaven's Hope bracelets and I have I will have a link below so on whether it's on YouTube or Facebook so you can learn a little bit more about those uh, they are we still have some in stock before the Christmas season is over and um, this is uh, sorry not this one this one is uh, the Heaven's Hope bracelet and I have shared that all before and just excited to have these available for you. Um, it's a wonderful story. Follow the link and there's a lot more information on that. Okay, so gonna get just started here so that this isn't a super long video. Okay, so I've got my pomegranate set up and today I have a nine by 12 canvas ready to go. It is a linen panel and um, I've got my little uh, pomegranate, pseudo still life. I guess it's a still life. It's not moving so <laughs> I have my spotlight right here and I have it kind of close because I like the dramatic lighting that a close um, spotlight gives you all right so I have toned my canvas it's probably a little bit hard to tell uh, from this video but it's just toned a very light kind of a little bit of blue um, all right so I am going to first of all I'll get tell your comments after and um, I will be checking every now and then to see if there's a question that I can help you with and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, so let me pull you in a little bit closer. Let's set this here. That is my stellite, and I want to try to make it so that you can see a little bit better what I'm doing, and uh, and my palette as well. So I may have to move you back just a little. Sorry, <laughs> this is all the stuff I normally do when, before I hit uh, live. All right, hi Phil, good to see you. And Lily. All right, so we may go in and out of reception. That was just a little glitch. Uh, in the When I upload it to YouTube, the, all of those get smoothed out. Okay, so let's get going. I've got my palette out today. I've got pretty much my regular colors with the addition of a couple more. Um, so I have titanium white. Um, this is magenta. I have cad yellow light and cad yellow medium. Uh, that cerulean blue is for another project I'm working on. And then um, a lizard crimson, or oh, it's a lizard permanent actually. And a little bit of phthalo green. Um, these are for another project. Okay, so I'm gonna put my little cup of linseed oil on here. And uh, so if I miss your comments, I will try to get them afterwards. And let's jump in. So. Getting ready for Christmas or whatever your time of year. Okay, so when I have my still life set up, like I said last week, it's one thing to set the still life up looking this way, but once you're sitting or you're in front of your easel, make sure that your still life is actually the way you want it looking this direction. Okay, so I'm gonna just use a little bit thinned down paint and a smaller brush, slightly smaller. This is a four, a uh, flat rosemary brush. Um, gonna take maybe a little bit of alizarin ultramarine blue I don't know yep you can see the palette a little bit if you don't want to see the comments you just have to swipe it over so that they're not in your way okay so I like this position where it's sort of um, a little bit uh, horizontal because I know that I want to make my um, arrangement going this direction 
So I want to see what sort of size and placement, what is the importance that this needs on my canvas. So I'm thinking about if the light's coming in this way and I've got my little cutting board arranged this way. And um, if I give this pomegranate about this much scale, just a loose, you know, how's that? Does that give it plenty of air to breathe around it? Is it too big for the size? Those are questions you have to ask yourself when you're working on um, whatever it is you're working on, whether it's a portrait, your plein air or anything. Do I have enough space for you know, air to get around it? And so there's my cutting board. I give it a start and a stop. So if my cutting board is here, if that's a pleasant space in from the edge and it's slightly slightly angled this way comes up this way it's sort of a wonky shaped cutting board but that's not what the thing's about so but I do want to give it a sense of beginning and end and then the pomegranate will sit on that so there's the bottom of it right here And I'm thinking about it in terms of mass as well, all the time, even at this early stage. It's important to, to think less linear pencil drawing and, um, and more uh, sculptural mass. I'm not left-handed. The Facebook's, uh, when it's on the selfie mode for Facebook Live, it's, it reverses everything. But sometimes I do switch hands just to confuse everybody. <laughs> kidding I don't sometimes I do all right so anyway back to thinking about sculpture so I'm sculpting out this pomegranate and at this point I'm not that preoccupied with the um the colors I am thinking about sort of the shadow masses as I'm sculpting though and I'm using a little bit more of the alizarin and the ultramarine blue just to work out those sculptural masses and then the inside of that wedge is going to come about like that. And then the back curvature will be about here. And at any point, you want to stop and ask yourself, is that, am I on track? Does that um, shape have a pleasing arrangement in here um, as we're moving forward? Does it if, it, if not, you need to stop and wipe it off and start over. And that's okay. Um, I always tell people, don't worry about wiping it off. They make more canvas. You can always, uh, that's why we like oil paint, actually. That's why I like oil paint. It's because it's so forgiving. It's not a big deal just to scrape it off. So I'm looking at this triangle shape of the front wedge as it's facing me. And you can kind of see it there in the video right there. And that is uh, a little bit more. I have it a little bit too up front. So I'm just going to take my paper towel and super easy to correct a mistake. And come up and around where that angles over. And I think that that is pretty much acceptable for the beginning of my pomegranate. Now, occasionally, I know you can't see, but I close um, one eye and I squint down at that to see uh, sort of where different lines intersect. Um, of course, squinting, as I've, as everybody says, has um, is a valuable tool to help you see uh, values. It flattens out the detail and makes it so that um, you can sort of minimize the the visual intake there but um one thing i'd also i also like about it is that um when i squint i can quickly see where this line might intersect this line and so those are things i'm looking for as i'm uh, just blocking in and laying out where i'm gonna go with this so you can see already instead of drawing the lines i'm just thinking about the what shape is this? What shape is this? How does it relate to that um, background? Messages so like that. Okay, very thinned 
I've got a little bit of linseed oil over here and I, I dip my brush in and then just sort of scrape it off on the cup just so that the bristles are barely wet with it. I don't want very much on my brush as I'm blocking this in. Um, I used to always use the odorless mineral spirits, but I'm trying to not use those as much in the studio, especially because um, they're not, it's not good to breathe. And, uh, you know, with health, we're all health conscious and it's been proven that it is unhealthy. <laughs> so why, why mess with fire? So, all right. Now I've got this white fabric coming down a little bit over here. So the edge of the cutting board is here and it's not that dark. So I'm going to use that dark, just sort of rearrange that shape there. Now I'm um, looking over here, if I squint down, I can kind of see the cutting board comes about there on that pomegranate and then it curves around this way. And then all the time, if you, if you are working on something at home, you can draw horizontal lines just with your brush and see where different lines intersect other lines just to help you with getting some of the location of some of these angles accurate. So when I look at this cutting board, this edge of the cutting board, this corner is right in line with the bottom of this wedge. So that gives me a point of reference to, um, to work out some of those unusual drawings. I always tell people to do that with books or whatever. Uh, a lot of people struggle with perspective, especially in their still lifes. Just uh, use as many of those horizontal lines as you can. Another thing I do is I'll, I'll make my brush a horizontal line and then I'll compare angles to it. So the cutting board angle, as it's angled at me a little, goes downward from that corner down to this corner. It's just a slight angle down. So if this is a straight line here, from that corner to that corner, just angling it down a little bit goes from here. Just you can make adjustments as you're going along. Sorry, <laughs> if we uh, if we do go in and out of uh, Wi-Fi, I'll still be here. <laughs> All right, so now um, the rest of this is just gonna. I don't want to take a lot of time with this fabric today. I'll save fabric for another lesson, but I do want to just sort of suggest it where I am with that. I'll use a little bit bigger brush to block in just some of the background. The background is important to the extent that I want to use it to help sculpt out the fruit. So I'm just going to block in uh, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, a little bit of um, white, might even take some yellow ochre. And I'm just making sort of a pile of that middle tone color that I see up there. Some of these shadow colors behind everything is a little bit dark blue in it than that. And it comes around in front here, a little more blue too, right here. And we got some back here. I set this arrangement up this way so that I could have a little bit of light, um, well, shadow. Sorry, behind the lit side of the pomegranate, I want a shadow up here and then some highlight down here as it slips into dark. Always thinking about. Um, the background relates to the object in the foreground. As far as what color or what value back there is helping to make something either pop out or um, where can you lose an edge? Okay, so let's get a little bit lighter. So in these passages here where there's a little more light hitting the background, I'm just going with that a little lighter value in there. 
And again, squinting down at that arrangement helps me to isolate where some of these blocks of value differences are. And up front here, a little more blue into this white down here in the shadow as the light just sort of slips down. We can take a little cadmium yellow into the white for some of these spots on the this fabric that's really lit. that that's going to pretty much take care of. I can always take more time on that, but I want to get onto the pomegranate. Okay, so getting into this. Now I'm going to work from the darkest to the lightest in working out the issues of this pomegranate. So taking a little bit of the alizarin permanent and ultramarine blue, this is going to be pretty much my darkest dark on this pomegranate. Now I have it sort of blocked in, at this point, I'm going to isolate where those darker places are on it. There's not many. It's, it's a higher key painting. Maybe a little bit more alizarin over here as these pomegranate seeds are in the shadow, but they're not very dark. Take a little more of the cadmium red. As I just inch my way over towards red that's a little lighter, I'm just adding to my pile, if you can see here on my palette. Um, I hope you can see that. <laughs> I'll kind of move it up a little. And then sort of mapping out where those brighter pomegranate berries are inside there. And I'm not worried about drawing every little berry. I'm thinking about where they are in relation to the whole mass. More cadmium red light. I'm going to add some white to that as we slip down into the paler berries. I just want those to have that nice sense of gradation in there. It looks really pretty. And these berries down here are all in shadow. So they get a little bit more of the blue into that alizarin so that they feel more like they're in shadow. This over here too. All right. Now this uh, is a very strong color on my brush. I can either get a new brush or just clean it off. So now um, the shadow parts of the membrane, a little bit of yellow ochre into the blue. I'll take a little more blue. Maybe some burnt sienna. It's, it's more like a warm shade of gray. And you always, I always just mix up a pile and let's see where we are. And maybe a little more blue. That was a lot. <laughs> I'll add a little more sienna. Yeah, that's better. 
squinting down, looking to see where the exact shape of that is. I'm not, I'm not married to this whole design that I have on the outside yet. What I'm concerned with is just blocking in the actual shapes now on the inside. What do I see? What shape is that? Always asking myself. Do I have this color anywhere else? While I have it, I may as well put it, I see some of it here. And a little in here. A little in here. Oh, I'll add a little more white to the yellow ochre. And this is just areas where I see a little bit more light, where the um, light is hitting this membrane. I see some of that right here. Right down here. I'm gonna take some cadmium yellow into that because where the light is a little bit stronger hitting it over here. I see some more of this yellow tone. Maybe it's a little bit grayer. Into that yellow. All of the beginning stages of painting a pomegranate are all about blocking, and then you can always come back through and refine more things up or whatever. But you want to just take your time and block it in so that it feels it has such a... Sorry, the pomegranate has such a wonderful shape that you definitely want to try to get that shape so that it has that, that feeling of form and mass. More yellow ochre up here. Being as angular as possible. All right. Now coming back through and kind of cleaning up the edge a little. I'm using alizarin permanent. Over on this side, there's a little bit more of the cadmium red where the light is hitting this strong red on this side. Some of that beautiful alizarin down the outside here. I'm tucking under. We've got some of that over on the other side too. On this one. Before I get too far, I want to make sure that there's a separation in value between that one, and then this wedge triangle shape that's coming at us. So I can maybe at this point just take a little white. Right, 
just helps me identify that that's where that piece takes a turn. Same thing with up here. I'll give it a little bit of a angle shine there to indicate that turn in the angle. Okay, coming back to here. Just now I'm gonna just sort of get in here and start filling in places where there's gaps, places where there needs to be a little bit more attention, berries that I haven't put in yet. Just sort of clean it up. A little more alizarin. Every now and then I'll just grab a little more alizarin, a little more um, cadmiums. All the time thinking about the shape of these masses inside the fruit itself. And then as you cut a pomegranate, that membrane gets stained and it's sort of that red. So just getting that in place a little bit too. All the way down around the edge, taking a little bit of that cadmium yellow with the red because it looks kind of orange on the where the rind meets the membrane. here gray shadowy membrane back in here as it slips behind those berries which will enable me to really make those berries right there in the middle shine so we'll give those a little bit of a darker background burnt sienna, yellow ochre. I'm looking at the stem now. I've got some passages on the actual construction of the tops of the blossom end here that are just sort of there. I'm looking forward to putting these little darker dimples on that side, but you have to be careful and, and restrain yourself from getting ahead of, of yourself before you're ready for that kind of detail. And in this stage of the painting, it's it wouldn't be the right time to put those in yet. Okay, I'm um, gonna 
I'm not done with the pomegranate, but I want to block in some of this cutting board just so it has a sense of being in its situation here. Okay, let's get some yellow ochre, some burnt sienna, some white, paint those together. Now, one thing I, I see a lot of uh, people do is they'll take the scoops of colors that they think they need and then they'll just mix the entire scoop that they've taken into a pile of paint. And the problem with that is that you don't know how much of what you just took you'll need. So what I tell people is just take little piles, just little piles of paint, and set them down. Just set them in little areas and then take from those piles um, to mix your paint. Just little bits of it. You, you know, you don't need the whole thing. You don't know that you'll need the whole thing. You might need more. But um, instead of wasting all that by continuing to mix and mix and mix, not sure if you got the right amount or whatever, just take little bits. And I don't use a palette knife for that same reason as you, you don't know when you take a scoop of your palette knife color, how much of that you will be needing. And once you've mixed it up with the palette knife, you somehow feel obligated to use that color. And I, I guess in my own experience, I prefer the spontaneity of um, working with my brush to get the right color. There's sort of that nice tactile quality. So now here I'm taking the color of the cutting board and I'm uh, sculpting out of the shadows some more of the form by using the color of the cutting board. If I'm going to do a very large painting, then I may mix up piles with a palette knife, but um, that's if I have a very large passage to paint um, in my painting. And I sprinkled a few berries on the cutting board because I want to demonstrate painting those little ones too. I just love painting the little jewels. Go ahead, so I will show you how I do those. Oops, not dark enough. I'm just laying down these shadows back here using those colors to sculpt out the pomegranate some more. And then as the light um, fades away from the center here where it's very hot, I let it get a little cooler. I'm always looking for passages where I can um, play with that movement of light. And you sometimes you have to push to find those, but um, they just make a painting so much more interesting when you can find the way that the light moves on an object whether it's a tree trunk or, um, you know, just a simple cutting board. And then I look for passages then where there's movement of temperature. 
So where does it go from cool to warm? And uh, so, I'm just gonna put a few little anchors under this cutting board. kind of leaning over the edge just a little. Then we'll make it a lot because that looks neat. Chardin would often put objects in his still life hanging over the edge of the counter because it created a sense of um, tension. Back to our fruit. Now that I think that um, we kind of have the environment around the object in place, pretty much, I'm going to come back through now and just um, sort of doctor up the edges, make sure that they all have that sense of being part of the environment. It's important to paint not things, not a pomegranate, but rather the reality in which it exists. I know that sounds like a lot of buzzwords, but what that means is instead of worrying about how to paint a pomegranate, think about how to paint it in its environment that it's sitting in. The light, the air, this movement of color and saturation, lack of saturation, then it becomes an exercise in observation, which essentially is all that still life painting is. All any painting is. <laughs> Plein air, portraiture, whatever you're doing. I mean, if you're not, you have to, you have to be dedicated to really observing what it is you're looking at. You can't go by what you think you know about any object because they're always different too. Okay, so now I am going to give it some nice strong anchors here on the table where the thing is sitting. All right, let's let those go back. Okay, now a little bit smaller brush. Now we're gonna go in and really tackle some more of the information inside, inside the fruit. So I'm looking at it and I'm trying to assess what else needs some work and some time and attention. So I'm gonna take a little bit more of the alizarin and mixing that into the cadmium red medium. I'm pretty much starting in the middle of the chrome spectrum. And then from here, I'll branch out. Does it need to be darker? Does it need to be lighter? So now I'm, I'm thinking about the shapes of the berries and how they relate to each other and the angle that they're nestled in their membranes. And, um, even though there's paint on the background and I'm kind of painting into it, you can, you can paint thick paint over thick paint by your application. If you do a lot of this and scrubbing on the canvas, you're going to get muddy color. It won't have a clear articulate voice, a sense of beginning, a start and end to your brush strokes, um, and so you'll get muddy. So lay the piece of paint down, have a start and a stop, 
and then get more. But you have to keep it cleaner that way. So in order to lay color directly on top of color, that's how you do that. Um, so this is called then a la prima, and that's one of the main strategies for painting a la prima, meaning in one sitting. I also, um, brushes tend to, to get um, clogged with paint, so I'm often twirling it on my palette. Instead of just wiping off all that paint that I'm actually using, I'll twirl it right on the palette and then scoop it up again. So over here, I see some really dark, um, dark ones slipped in the shadows. <clears throat> Let me come down back here. Some of those, these darker passages that I had got a little bit lost, so I'll just pull them back out again. And then back here where these paler um, berries are sitting in the membrane. A little bit softer, lighter. You can kind of blend them into the membrane a little bit. And I'm going to take a little bit of that grayish color that I was using for the membrane and tuck it back in here. I just feel like it, there's not much of a shadow <clears throat> in between the, these two. It still needs more shadow in here. Always correcting, rearranging, seeing what needs a little bit more work. I always say it's so much like life, <laughs> painting. Clean up the edge over here that I kind of lost. All right, um, I think while I have it, I think I could, at this point, just take a soft grayish red and start putting in some of these darker little dimples on this side. I don't know if you can see that. Not really in there. <laughs> and some are lighter. Or darker. 
Let's start with the lighter ones. Try to make sure that the shape of these little dimples accurately represents the little pomegranates peeking through. There's not many, so I'll just kind of keep that softer. What I want to encourage you as as you're working on still lifes is to don't don't try to take a picture of your still life and work from your photo because photos and still lifes are an absolute no no <laughs> because um, it, a photo is going to flatten out all of the information that you need and um, sort of kill any of those wonderful effects that I was referring to, movement of light and uh, movement of cool and warm shadows and things like that. So um, definitely don't want to do that. Okay, so I kind of like where that's going. I keep going back into the fruit now and just sort of clean up inside the shape here. The membrane, I think, is an area where I think a lot of people struggle with because it can be so abstract and it's hard to know um, what to paint and, and all of the different shades of that cream color that you see inside there. But if you just take it little pieces at a time and just, you know, like this little passage in here, I know you can't see it from where you are, it's just a little um, shape that is mostly in shadow. It's a little bit more yellow ochre. And um, just take it little bites at a time. Uh, then before you know it, you've kind of got things that sort of make sense. And um, that's the, what do they say? It's how do, how do you eat an elephant? Just one bite at a time. <laughs> but I don't think it's so overwhelming that, um, there's just so much detail because, um, I mean, I'm not being a hundred percent accurate with it because, um, it's just not that important. It's not about capturing it like a photo. It's about capturing the reality that this pomegranate exists. In, like I mentioned earlier. And I don't know if you can see on my palette, but I'm just taking some cadmium yellow and some white. And I'm getting a very light, uh, um, sort of that white color of the membrane. When you're going along working on something and you just have, it starts to, you start to realize you just have a lot of that middle tone color. It can tend to feel a little bit muddy. Or not muddy, but just like you're just stuck in the middle tone. And uh, so when you do, just start grabbing some of the lights because they may have either gotten um, lost or whatever. So I'm just putting in some of the bright, the brightest color in there, my lightest light. more cadmium red light as I work out um, some of these berries over here that are 
little bit more in the light. These right here in the center are just really the jewels of the whole thing. They're really getting this beautiful bright light hitting it and they're allowed to just shine and be pretty. They're just sort of clustered there. And then as it slips down into shadow, they get lighter and lighter. So a little more cab yellow and white to that. Some of that over here. Anywhere else we have it? Some of this, um, where the seeds of the berries are, are peeking through, there's a little bit lighter of the, the seed itself. I'm going to clean my brush off and just take some of the membrane color and soften it right up into the seed. Letting the tops of the berries be nice and sharp and crisp, but the bottoms will look more like they're part of the membrane if I can just soften them into their environment a little bit more. Okay, now I want this wedge here to have more of an articulate shape in front of everything that's coming out at us. membrane. Give that a, oh, that looks like a good color. More blue. Sometimes if a, if a shadow doesn't look, you're mixing the color up and you know it's the right color, but when you put it on the painting and it doesn't look dark enough, it's very possible that it's not your shadow that's the right, that's wrong, but it's the highlights that are not um, bright enough. So I'm gonna come back through here and just lighten behind that piece that I was working on, as well as the membrane. And then that'll push that shadow back a little bit. And then now that kind of has a nice sense of being part of this passage. I'm going to clean up this right here, the skin. It's really beautiful red on this side too. more 
lizard. As this turns, it goes under. And I lift my brush as I slip down into shadow just so that it can soften those strokes. make this one over here really sing a little bit more. So that's cad red. Just right over the top and I'm letting some of that color from underneath just shine through. Okay. We have a ochre. find this and I'm making I'll, I'm at the point now where I'm going through and doing some of the finishing touch items on here just making sure that all of it is going to hold together and then i will come through and put the highlights on the little berries as well as um oh sorry i froze i'm sorry um doing the berries on the counter when this video is uploaded to youtube none of those will be in it i hope that <laughs> I don't know if it was still recording. I don't know how long it, it wasn't recording. Um, gosh, sorry. <laughs> if I'd known, I, I usually try to stop talking. Now some highlights. So this is just white. I'm gonna just let it go right on the edge. <clears throat> and then some white right here. I'm gonna scumble that across just a little. All right, now I am going to work on selecting the berries that are going to be front and center. So there's one berry in particular that right up in here that's getting, has a nice flat edge. It's getting a lot of light hitting it. So we're gonna go like this. And then um, some more down below. Over here. And these berries are a little bit more cadmium red as the light's shining through them. I like that little tiny um, sliver of cadmium red that just gives it that nice transparent quality. And I'm going to put that in a few other places where I see it. Just down here.
but I don't want to do it where on anything that is supposed to be in shadow. Because if I put a highlight on it in a shadow, it'll kill that effect of looking like it's not getting any light. <laughs> Okay, now a few more highlighted pieces. I'm just going to take a tiny brush and start putting in some of those tiny highlights. Little dots. And sometimes they're straight lines indicating that the fruit has sort of a jewel-like angularity to it. And carefully deciding where I want to put these. Not everywhere gets a highlight. Not everywhere that where I see one on there. Because it's sort of like music notes. You have to decide um, what makes it interesting as the eye travels through the object you're painting. Some of these up here are really getting some nice light hitting them. We got a highlight on one of these. Now, just some of the seed stems as they're showing through. We got some over here, a little bit more obvious. I'm gonna take some cadmium yellow and white put it in some of these places here where these seeds are fading. They're not as ripe. <laughs> Alright, and then um, some of these Pieces of uh, membrane have a little shine on them too, so I'm just going to give those a little bit of attention here. Now, that was too much, so I'm going to just take my brush, dry it off, and scrape some of that off. Now, I said I would do some of the um, seeds on the thing down here, so that brush is too small. <clears throat> we'll get um, that should be fine. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to, when I do the pomegranate seeds, is just to get the darkest red that I see on it first. and. That's usually like a cadmium, or sorry, a lizarin permanent. I'm running out of space. Maybe a little cad red deep. So, just gonna start laying them on here. The whole shape. Everything that I see for the whole shape. I'm not worried about the seed inside. Just, um, here, I'm going to bring you in a lot closer so that you can see these. Uh, 
I hope that is helpful. Okay, so we've got a little bit of the seed here and a little seed next to it. And I can always, I, and which I will, I'll, I'll take the um, wood color and refine some of those. Just want to get the shape in. There's some over here. I don't have to put all of them in. But again, this is pretty much just straight alizarin and cadmium. Okay, so. So over here, I'll just show you on these. This seed over here that I'm gonna do is a little lighter than the others. So I'll show you how to do one that's not quite as dark red. Okay, so inside I take um, yellow ochre and some white and you just have to sort of experiment with how much you take. This is the beginning of the seed in the, in the little berry. Same thing with the little pale one over here. You've got one over here. Okay, now um, alizarin permanent <clears throat> is, is more light fast. Alizarin crimson fades in the sun. They look identical though, and they're the same price. Um, but yeah, just learning that there was even a difference, I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> now I do. Um, okay, so this is cadmium red, deep and light, and I'm putting this kind of at what would be the tip of the seed on the inside. And this gives it sort of that glass-like effect, like we're looking through the seed. Now there's two more things that have to be done to make it look like the pomegranate seed and that is the shadow. So I'm gonna give them each a shadow. And I try to keep the shadows in the, in the red family actually because the light is shining through the seed and it's sort of like stained glass giving them a shadow like that. Okay, this little guy over here. Now, last thing, the sparkles. Okay, so. I'm gonna just go a little line We'll go up here and do one little dot. They start looking like pomegranate seeds. 
That's a really tiny indication there. A little one here. We can't leave this guy out. All right, so I hope that that helps with how one might tackle a pomegranate. And um, so I want to thank everyone for joining me and I hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, be sure to check out uh, the links that I will um, show you. Is, is my sparkle, th yes, it is thicker paint. Uh, I always paint whites or highlights thicker uh, they break the surface of the canvas and they give more thrust, so they are more impasto. Um, but yeah, all right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. And I don't know 100% if I will be back next week. Um, we'll have to see how it goes. I had an idea as I walked through the kitchen. I saw um, a fruitcake and I thought, oh my gosh, it'd be kind of fun to paint <laughs> a fruitcake. So anyway, I will, I'll see what happens in the course of the week. I'm pretty busy. And I know everybody else is going to be busy with the holidays too. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a wonderful Christmas if I don't see you before then.